it took an entrepreneur to get this this economy, this community, this nation off the ground. Somebody had to start it. It's constantly inspiring people to do different things. You know, you're trying to invent something that will improve the quality of life for everyone in the world. The importance is to uh, get your ideas out there um, so everyone can share it and share your ideas with the world. It would be owning your own business kind of thing. You don't have to listen to the man, so to speak, kind of thing. Um, and then you can run your company the way you want it ran instead of listening to corporate ideas. It keeps us progressing forward and um, evolving. I don't think it should be about the money. I think if you're inventing something, it should always better the world. If it's truly a great idea, money will come afterwards. But if it's also a great idea and the person is selfless, money doesn't matter. Well, I mean, I would like to think that it would be about implementing a new idea, but I mean, if I got rich, I don't think I'd be upset. Uh, I just want to do something that will make me a lot of money so I never have to work a day in my life. I could care less about the money. I would, if I had my own business, I'd give it I'd give it away to charity after, you know, all my expenses were paid. I want to make sure that what I'm trying to get accomplished would get out there rather than personal benefit and greed. I would think the great idea of hitting all the people and seeing who it could help and really getting to those people and really changing their lives with it. I mean, money is fabulous, but I mean, giving me money just gives you money. Absolutely about implementing your ideas. If you do it for the money, you're going to die out the way that the economy is. You're constantly going up and down. If you do it with your heart, then that's really never going to get old. Non-impenetrable bulletproof vests. Knife couldn't go through it, a bullet couldn't go through it, just to actually protect the lives of law enforcement. Uh, one of the best things that people probably will say and always want to say is a cure for cancer. We have this system of like cars running on oil and you know how we get our electricity that we, it's like uh, the tough question is like how much is it going to cost to switch over. So I think that if somebody had the answer for that or could solve that faster instead of as slow as it's going, I think that would be awesome and we'd be a lot better off. An armada of Roombas for the ocean, for ocean pollution. Probably something to improve like agriculture or farming because that's not going to be, um, that's something that's dwindling it's, and prices will be increasing. So if I were to create something that could improve the quality of food and increase the production time of it, that would be something really cool because it's something everyone can use around the world, not just here. Probably something to help people in third world countries, um, like cleaner water, better energy. A new systematic approach to like looking at, at situations and like problem solving. I have to do a self-driving car because I think a lot of people on the road don't know how to drive properly, so that would help them out a lot, keep them in their lanes. You can't really do anything by yourself. It's always good to have people help you, work with you, and like anything big that you can think of, nobody did it on their own. So teamwork makes a dream work. To bring people around because you're not going to be there for forever, and if you want your idea to last a while, you need people to work on it and prove it. So um, keeping them close but not telling them everything, I think, is more important. It's all about who you can trust, and that like especially your own business and um, I think I'd have to limit the amount of people I'd want to bring in. You want to make sure that, they're, that you can help as many people as you can because they're going to be the ones that help lift you up rather than you climb that ladder by yourself. You know, the more people, the more minds, the more minds, the more ideas, the more ideas, the more progress. Anytime that you shut anybody out, you kind of lose. I mean, like, you start, you know, having less and less people to share your idea with so they can't, you know, you never know who you're going to talk to. They can help you grow your idea or they can help you, you know, better your idea just that much more. Definitely to keep people with me because they can share other things that can probably better the technology or even if it's not technology, better the idea. The closed hand, you can't really get anything in or take anything out. If you got an open hand, you can receive and you can give. And at the end of the day, it's human nature. We're supposed to be giving and receiving anyway. One thing I wish I had invented was would be the laptop. An airplane. The automobile, for sure. Nintendo, the company, or like the iPod. Pen. Everybody uses a pen. The phone. The x-ray, maybe the MRI. The waterbed. <laughs> the waterbed. <laughs> a surfboard that was self-propelled. I wish I would have invented Google. Um, post-its. 
I would have liked to have taken credit for marshmallows. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Michelle Morell, and I am the executive director of the Eastern Florida State College Foundation. Thank you all for joining us here today for the B.W. Simpkins Entrepreneurial Lecture Series. We are going to be very excited, we are very excited to welcome F. Scott Moody, who will be speaking momentarily. Um, but before we get started, and in keeping with the technology theme, we're going to do something a little different here today. As you can tell from the video, that video was filmed on our Melbourne campus last week, and we came out and asked students what they thought about entrepreneurship. That is our first step in this series, and we're going to be advancing the series to find out what our students want to hear about, and what do they want to see here at our, at our theater and at our college. So there's a lot of exciting things coming. Well, at this time, let's go ahead and move forward with the program. Um, at, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Simpkins for all of his support and his continued support of the entrepreneurship lecture series and our curriculum as well. So Mr. Simpkins, thank you very much for your support. I'd also like to just give you an idea of who's in our audience. Not only do we have some of our local high schools, we have their business academies, their tech academies, we have a lot of community partners, we have our college board of directors, our King Center board of directors, our board of trustees, and a lot of faculty, staff, and students. So I thank you all very much for being here today. We couldn't do this without you. The B.W. Simpkins Entrepreneur Lecture Series was founded and funded by Bernie Simpkins. His family has continued to leave a legacy of entrepreneurship and allowed us to do programs like this here today. Mr. Simpkins has dedicated his interest in personal business to the college. Uh, we have formulated a lot of partnerships with him. He has supported us in numerous ways and previously serving with distinction on our board of trustees and is currently our board chair for the College Foundation. It is with great pleasure at this time that I introduce Mr. Bernie Simpkins. This is all new, wasn't it, on the screen? And it's just a great addition to Michelle. Thanks for doing it. And thanks for doing all you do. We have some very special people here in the audience, and I can't begin to name all of them. But I want to welcome all of you, tell you we appreciate you coming out. We've got a great speaker coming on. I've got one, one person I just have to mention. He is my next door neighbor, and that's the reason I want him to stand up and and be acknowledged. Bob Stover, of executive editor of today, stand up. His wife is redoing his house, so that's the reason he's here, so he doesn't have to work at his house. Um, George, where are you? Would you come on up, please? It's my pleasure to give you an award today of the Bernie Simpkins Entrepreneur Scholarship Award, which is awarded to a student that has demonstrated commitment to entrepreneurship. And George, for your information, has an average grade point average of 3.61. That's worth talking about, isn't it? In December 2013, George graduated from Eastern Florida with a certificate of entrepreneurship, operations, and continuing his education in the college in pursuit of his bachelor's degree. George grew up in a military family, stationed in several locations throughout the United States. After settling in Florida and graduating in high school in West Palm Beach, George entered his, earned his engineering degree and worked in government contracting. During that time, George became interested in social entrepreneurship and in 2008 founded Miller Media Group, MMG, a nonprofit television and video production company created for the advancement of Christian singer songwriters and benefiting philanthropic organizations throughout the Space Coast. MMG now produces several public service television programs and also sponsors songwriter concerts for charity here at the King Center. To date, 
George's company has helped over 100 local profit organizations and community causes while advancing the careers of more than 50 local artists. George, congratulations. It's my pleasure you, to Mr. present you to the awesome. You want to say anything? Just a great big thank you to uh, Mr. Simpkins for founding this entrepreneurship uh, program here at Eastern Florida State College for his vision and for his generosity. Um, that's a great honor. Thank you, Mr. Simpkins. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Simpkins, and congratulations, George. At this time, I have the honor of introducing Eastern Florida State College President, Dr. Jim Ritchie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Michelle. I'd like to welcome you to the highly acclaimed Simpkins Seminar featuring a true 21st century innovator. It's Mr. F. Scott Moody. You may or may not know his name, but millions of people around the world are using his creation this very minute. You may be familiar with the fingerprint sensor on the Apple, uh, Apple iPhone that is used to unlock the device or to make purchases online. Scott took this excellent idea and ran with it starting his own company and eventually selling it and the sensor technology to Apple for hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know where you guys are from, but where I'm from, that's a lot of money. He's an entrepreneur in the classic sense and a visionary who is remaking our world. I know his path to success will inspire you just as it has me. Uh, with that said, Scott would not be our speaker today if not for the man for whom the lecture series is named Mr. Bernie Simpkins. Mr. Simpkins is a highly successful businessman who set up an endowment in 2001 to create this very important lecture series. Since then, some of the nation's top businessmen and women have come to the college to tell their stories of success. His generosity also led to the establishment of the college's business entrepreneurship program, which was recently named Best Emerging Program by the National Association of Community Colleges. I speak for everyone at the college in thanking him for his tireless efforts to inspire the next generation of business leaders. Thank you, Bernie. I would also like to note that today's seminar comes at an exciting time for students at Eastern Florida State College. We are poised to launch seven new bachelor degrees this August in the fast growth job fields of business, healthcare, and computer information technologies. We also have two other bachelor degree programs in business already underway with hundreds of students enrolled. These new educational opportunities can give students the tools they need to start their own businesses and to pursue the American dream. And maybe, maybe even become the next F. Scott Moody. With no further delay, it is now my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Scott Moody. So, hashtag good morning. Um, so, you know, actually, I always find these uh, introductions relatively embarrassing. I, I don't know who they usually introduce, but it's, it's not me. The fact of the matter is, is that, you know, if I, if I look, I find a lot of the introductions made for entrepreneurs to be somewhat misleading. The fact of the matter is, I, I tend to think that this whole idea of entrepreneurialism is a bit of a fad. You know, people, they talk about, you know, you can go out and write an app, you know, come up and develop some code, come up with some idea, maybe, you know, quit school, and in a couple of years, oh, you know, maybe a little bit longer than that, you can sell your company for a billion dollars. It all looks so easy, it's unbelievable. So then all of a sudden people like me get introduced as this, you know, great visionary or, you know, some great leader. People give speeches like the one I'm about to give you now, and you know, on the other side of that, they go out and write a book, and they tell you exactly how they did it, and the 10 things that you need to do to start your own company. And looking back, the dots all look like they aligned perfectly. Like this person started out with a plan, moved forward, and it had no, no chance not to be successful. Actually, that's not true. Most of those didn't start out with a perfect plan. 
and the leader that you see today and them telling you how they did it and those dots looking back, aligning so perfectly, isn't how it really happened. So today, I'm here to tell you about some of my own crooked path. Hopefully there's no, uh, you know, cops in the, uh, in the audience, so, um, but you know, it's the reality of the situation. And at the end of the day, I hope that you walk away, you know, maybe a little bit inspired and motivated, not just to be an entrepreneur, but to make a difference in your lives. So, when I, I know there's a lot of students here today, and my own daughters and students that I work with, and I, I give a lot of talks really all over the, the world, um, particularly in the southeast, but I was just over in Ghana, I was in Rwanda uh, last summer, and you meet all these kids that really want to be an entrepreneur, and they're trying to figure out exactly what they want to do in life. Again, they look and they read these books, and they see that these dots were so perfectly aligned. They're pushing themselves to have the perfect answer by the time they graduate in terms of what I want to do in my life. So a little bit about my own history. So if you look at my resume, you know, it looks pretty good. I made sure it looked relatively good. Uh, you know, I graduated from NC State in industrial engineering. I went to work for a company uh, here, of course, you know, called uh, Harris Semiconductor. And just dropping back, when I was in school, I was a resident advisor. So, you know, I had all this, you know, good stuff. I, I went to a, a good school, I got an engineering degree, you know, I worked full time and I was a resident advisor, showed, you know, I could be a good leader. And then I went to work for a company called Harris, Harris Corporation, Harris Semiconductor, now Intersil locally, and I got all of this functional experience in the 18 years that I was there. It all looks pretty good. But let me tell you kind of some of the quirks in that resume. So first off, here I was, I was running uh, a division of a semiconductor company, about $200 million, and then with my co-founder Dale Setlack, who I'll introduce shortly, is we founded this company, Authentech, which was fundamentally a semiconductor company. Pretty tough stuff. My degree was in industrial engineering. In the entire time I was in college, which actually lasted five years, um, I, got, I took three double E classes. That's the foundation of semiconductor technology. And all that time I only took three double E classes. They all happened to be double E 101. I failed it the first time. I dropped it the second time. It was at 7.50 in the morning. There was no way. And I finally passed it the third time with the lowest grade you could possibly get and still, you know, consider passing. And believe me, I did not take double E 102. I was a resident advisor. Okay, that looks pretty good. You know, you're, you know, you're in charge of a, a dormitory. You know, you're a leader of, of people, in this case, little boys. Um, and, but what I don't put on my resume is they actually, I was only a resident advisor for one year. They actually asked me, you know, not to come back the second year. I was probably the only resident advisor in the history of North Carolina State that was arrested twice in the same semester. I I'm telling you, it, it's, it doesn't look good when the resident advisor of the dorm, you know, who's supposed to be taking care of other people's kids, is arrested twice. I won't go into the details of exactly how I was arrested. So, um, and those are only two of the very, very, I want to assure you, few times that I was ever arrested. So. And then I went to Harris. Now that seems like a very logical choice. Let me tell you how I got to Harris. My, uh, my senior year in college, you know, I was broke. I was, was pretty much always broke. There was spring break coming up. I had no money to go on spring break. So all of a sudden, there, there's a student newspaper. It's called The Technician. And I saw an ad in there from this company called Harris Corporation that was on the beach, because they mentioned that in the ad, in Melbourne, Florida. I never heard of Melbourne before, but it was on the beach in Florida. That seems like a really good place to go for a spring break. So I already had taken a job. So I actually went to the on-site, on-campus interview with Harris Corporation, and they actually flew me down here to have the interview. Except they usually flew you one night, you interviewed all the next day, and then you flew back the next night. 
I talked him into putting me up for four nights. So my entire spring break was here in Melbourne, Florida. I had no interest at all at working for Harris Corporation or Harris Semiconductor, but I really had a great spring break. So back in the day, when I graduated from college, the drinking age was 18. It still is, it's just a matter of whether it's legal or not. And so, you know, I, uh, I went out, I got there, you know, one night, had a nice time at the beach, and the next night I, uh, I went out, and Cocoa Beach used to be, you know, jammed with bars. And there was this place, for those that go back a long time, this was 1980, uh, there was a place called Brasses. And so I went to Brasses. And Brassies didn't close till like 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And I took a cab back to my uh, hotel, Sheer Rock Shores. I remember this down in, uh, in Melbourne Beach. And the next day, I had to get up for my interview, drove in, got a little lost, was there a little bit late. And I had this first interview with a guy named John Short. Now, John Short, he was a great, great guy. He really had gone back to the early days of semiconductor technologies, at Texas Instruments and invented a lot of the early technologies, particularly around dielectric isolation. And he was my first interview. It was supposed to be 40 minutes. It lasted like two and a half hours. And the entire time, I really had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> Semiconductors, wafers. I ate wafers, but I, I didn't know anything about a you know, wafer technology. And it was exceedingly difficult because I was probably still a little bit drunk. And man, I was hung over. So, this is how I planned out perfectly my career. They actually made me an offer. It was significantly more than the offer I had already uh, or was looking at taking. And so I ended up coming down to Harris Semiconductor. Two and a half years later, I was laid off. That kind of stank. It was very depressing at the time. Uh, you know, you wonder, you know, about your value and your career and the decisions that you made. But I ended up transferring from Harris Semiconductor over to Harris Government Systems. And I worked for a guy named Bill Nolan. Bill, we called him Wild Bill. I won't go into the details, but the guy was a little radical. But he was a great boss, and he taught me so much. And that started my career, if you will, of, of not only moving up, but the whole idea of every couple, three years, here I worked for a big company and gained all this functional experience. None of that is in my resume. None of that is usually what people get up and talk about. They talk about going to some school and engineering and they were a very smart person and they got this job and you know, so on and so forth. The one thing that I, you know, if you look back at, at many of those things, getting laid off or, you know, getting arrested or, failing classes. You might look at those things as failures, but I don't. I look at them as experiences. And that's really kind of the first idea I want to you know, tell the budding entrepreneurs. It's this whole thought I have around the fallacy of failure. I don't believe in failure. Ideas fail, companies fail, businesses fail, all kinds of things fail, and if you ever spend any time in a place like Rwanda or many other countries, entire countries can fail. But you only fail if you give up. To me, all of those things, I don't care. They're just experiences. When I'm going through them, they don't feel like so much fun at the time, and maybe I'm not joking about them, and I certainly want to win. But the fact of the matter is, I chalk it up as an experience own learning experience. And that's one of the critical things that I you know, think that young people and students and really everybody should think of. Don't worry about the failures. Don't worry about what somebody else is going to say. Just get moving. Start down the path. And as you start down that path, you'll learn what you like and you'll learn what you don't like. And you'll learn about yourself. There's nothing I would have changed about my career. There's things I probably could have done better, but who knows? But it was a great career, and I had great experiences and great learning opportunities. And I tell people now, don't worry about it so much. Don't fret about it. 
Start moving forward. And if you don't like something, go try something else. And if you don't like that, go try something else. But just start moving forward and don't be afraid of what some people call failure and what I would call just gaining experiences. So as long as we're talking about failure, <laughs> let's talk about some of the cold, hard facts of entrepreneurialism. There are two million, roughly, and you'll see all kinds of statistics, but I glammed on a few here. There are roughly two million businesses a year started in the US. That is a lot of businesses. Most of those are what we generally refer to as a lifestyle business. A lifestyle business in that it provides your salary, it's something that you want to grow, but it's something generally over time that you own. It could be a restaurant, it could be a chain of restaurants, it could be any number of things, but it's generally something that you and maybe one or two other people own. My expertise, or my, I won't say expertise, my knowledge and my experience is in what we would generally refer to as equity or venture oriented. The idea then is we're gonna go out and raise money, we're gonna sell equity in the company, and that we have an exit idea and an exit strategy, either to sell our business or to go public. Now, most of those two million businesses started every year are lifestyle. But there are tens of thousands of companies started every year, whether they incorporate or not, tens of thousands of companies every year that start along the venture equity path. Venture capitalists literally look at thousands of deals only to invest in two or three a year. Of those two million businesses and tens of thousands of tech-oriented businesses, only 600, roughly 600 a year, get Series A venture capital. That's early stage venture capital, generally industrial, uh, an industrial kind of investment of three to five million dollars. Two million, six hundred. And for all those 600, only 40% of the time does the VC get their money back. 40%. And I'm not talking about a home run. I'm just talking about getting their money back. 60% of the time, the businesses fail. And if they get any money back, it's associated with selling the furniture and maybe a few patents. So you're dealing with very, very smart people, venture capitalists, who invest in very, very smart people. And 60% of the time, the company goes out of business. So, you know, you gotta ask yourself, you know, why do you wanna go do that? Is it about money? Is it about riches? Is it about fame? It's, is it because you hate your company or that you're working for now? Or is it that you wanna kind of go out and prove something? To me, Work is like a sport. It's the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Believe me, if I was taller, faster, bigger, if I had any athletic ability whatsoever, I would have loved to have been a professional athlete and then a coach. I could have easily been the guy running up and down the sideline, you know, the veins popping out in the neck, screaming and yelling, and then going home that night and, you know, watching game film. I could be that guy. In fact, I was that guy. So, you know, I was coaching five-year-old little girls playing soccer, <laughs> right? Running up and down the sideline, looking like a freaking idiot, and throwing my hat down long before Steve Spurrier ever came up with that little trick over at UF. I loved it. I just was into it. And that was kind of the same way, you know, I looked at work. It was fun. I enjoyed it. It's, you know, really, I'm no NBA player, but I make a lot of sports analogies. And if you think about it, go back to, you know, when you were younger, or an NBA star now was younger, why did they start playing basketball when they were 8, 9, or 10, or even younger? It wasn't about money. It wasn't about, you know, they were thinking about this big contract. They were thinking about fame and cool and being on TV and making that last shot. It was really cool. They, they got into the sport because of the love of the game. And so very, very few, of course, got up to the NBA. But even when you're there, just think about it. Of course, they're getting paid. But it is a tough life. 
you know, you're traveling all the time, um, you know, you're all over the country, hotel to hotel, you play all these games, you're tired, you may be sore and beat and injured, and then you have some freaking moron in the paper the next day saying, you know, what you did wrong and, you know, why they should trade you and, geez, does that seem like fun? By the end of the season, you got to be pretty darn beat. But for the biggest players out there, just think about what is the biggest room in their house when they go back home? It's their indoor basketball court. They like the game. And that's the thing that's going to keep you going when things aren't so good. Like I, I was invited, you know, I was introduced as, you know, the founder of, or co-founder of, of Authentech. But there were a lot of dark days in those times. Just like it is for that NBA player. It's the shot at the end of the game that didn't go in. Right? It's the bad season. It's the bad quarter. What keeps you motivated the next day? It's because you love what you do. You feel like you're making a difference, right? It's something that you inherently enjoy. And you will have those bad days. You'll have a lot of those bad days. Quarters where you don't even think you're going to make it. Years when your product doesn't work and, you know, you think you're going to run out of money. It's the love of the game that's going to keep you going. And if you don't love the game, you're not going to be able to keep going. So the second, you know, key thing I would, I would tell a budding entrepreneur is get your why straight. Why are you doing this? What is your motivation? And if it's just about money, eh, you're probably not going to make it. Probably end up, you know, <laughs> getting a divorce and then giving half of it away anyway. All right? So, you know, if it's just about money, and I know this is being filmed and I have a lot of good investment banker friends, but I always joke, you know, if you just want the money, become an investment banker. If you have a deeper thought of why, then you have the opportunity to become an entrepreneur. Let's talk a little bit about Authentic. So despite what you read all the time, right, and despite, you know, a number of the introductions uh, I receive, I did not invent the technology. It, in fact, was not even my idea. I co-founded the company with a guy named Dale Setlack, who is generally referred to as the smart guy. Dale's here. Dale, would you mind sit, standing up? So, <clears throat> so Dale really is the foundation of this company. I get to stand up here. I've got to stand up in the last, the entire time we had the company because, you know, I got to be the CEO and he got to be the CTO. But the fact of the matter is the foundation and that fingerprint sensor that you're using on, on your iPhone now is really Dale, not me. Now, you might think I started this company because, or co-founded this company with Dale because he was a smart guy. And believe me, that had a lot to do with it. But the real reason, kind of I chose Dale, if you will, to start a company with, to quit a company, a, with a good job and start a company is because of Dale as a person. And I saw Dale as a person, and I, I've never told him this, I don't think, but was because Dale was a great father. I got to know Dale over several months before we started a company. And I got to see him in action and being a father. He was a single father, and he raised three unbelievably great and also incredibly smart children. That was the kind of person that I wanted, right, to strike out with. And to me, you know, that person and those people in the beginning that you start a company with, it's, it's almost like a marriage. You'll probably spend more time with them than you will with your spouse. There'll be good times and there'll be bad times. But in the end of the day, I completely trusted Dale and we're exceedingly good friends to this day. So that's lesson number three. Go find a co-founder. You don't know it all. I was okay at business. I was okay maybe at sales, right? 
but I knew nothing on the technology side. And you can't really know it all, and I think that whole idea of finding a co-founder or co-founders is so important. But take your time. Make sure you really know the person, not just what they know, but who they are. But Dale didn't really come up with this idea on his own. He worked with a guy who I had known for a number of years, a guy named Nick Van Vano. Nick is here. Nick, would you please stand up? So Nick was actually the person that introduced me to Dale, and I had known Nick for a number of years. We had worked together, fought many times over those years, but I greatly respected both his technical abilities and Nick as a person. I completely, just like I said with Dale, trusted Nick. But I do remember that first time Nick and Dale walked into my office, right? And, you know, I thought it was interesting. This was back in the day. I was at Harris Semiconductor and, uh, you know, I had a wood paneled office and, you know, still wearing a suit at work and, you know, it was, it was really nice. And here comes Nick. And then behind him comes this long haired guy, right? You know, and at first, right, I thought, why did Nick bring in this homeless guy, you know? <laughs> so, you know, he has long hair, still does, you know, balding on top, balding. Uh, you know, wears a nose ring, often has a fanny pack, which I, I don't honestly still to this day think is a great fashion accessory. And, <laughs> but, you know, and, and they came forward with this idea of a fingerprint sensor. And in my pocket, right here, I have the original cell phone with a fingerprint sensor. Okay, this was 1997. It was a while ago. Tell us we weren't visionaries if our idea was, you know, not to put a fingerprint sensor on a cell phone. This was a cell phone in 1997. And here, if you can see it, is a fingerprint sensor. It's not actually a fingerprint sensor. It was another product that we were building at Harris Semiconductor that, frankly, failed miserably. And, but it did have the opportunity that one of the products were, you know, built on the back, just kind of stuffed in here. And Dale and Nick brought this idea to me. Of course, at first I thought it was a really stupid idea. Um, but I trusted Nick, and as we went forward, you know, we were able to prove out the technology. I used to tell people, this is the first working cell phone with a fingerprint sensor. Now, the fingerprint sensor didn't work, but the cell phone did. <laughs> right? So it was the first working cell phone with a fingerprint sensor. But, um, you know, those two didn't do it on their own either. We went out and started recruiting originally a team that we could bring forward and make this, you know, vision a reality. And this was tough stuff. When Apple bought out Authentic, we had over 200 patents. That's a lot of patents. That is a lot of invention. That is a lot of technology. But that could not have happened had we not had the fortune to bring into our folds right away a guy named Dave Gebauer. Dave, would you mind standing up? <clears throat> so Dave is what you refer to as an analog engineer. They're a very, very strange group of people. So, uh, you know, they're the guys with a, oops, a pocket protector, you know, with 15 pencils in them but still can't find one. In fact, I noticed he still has a bunch of stuff, you know. Um, but boy, Dave was smart. And not only was Dave smart, back to that, uh, that whole thing about working together as a team, I had known Dave for a number of years, worked with him carefully on many programs at Harris Semiconductor, greatly respected his talents as an engineer, greatly respected his talents as an engineer. We couldn't have done it without him. He was the last person I basically recruited into Authentech. It was hard to get him. But I'll tell you, most analog engineers are pretty conservative folks. He took a gamble. He left a good job, highly respected, not only in the company but in the community, and joined this little startup. So really, there's a couple lessons in that. 
First off, look at these guys. They're all old guys, right? <laughs> so I was 40 years old when I started Authentic, and I actually just started another company called K4 Connect. I'm 57 years old. I'm pretty old, right? And I'm young compared to these other guys. I'm the youngest, but only by a couple of years in a couple of cases. So, you know, I tell youths as they, you know, look at being an entrepreneur, if you really want to be an entrepreneur, go get a job. Go get experience in something. I meet many people that just want another Instagram startup or Facebook or God knows another bar app. Why? Because that's really what they know. The advantage that we had when we started our company is we knew our space very well. We were all new to fingerprint sensing technologies, which was probably good because we thought about it differently. But we knew the customers that we wanted to deal with. We knew the technology. We knew the operations. We had significant experience. And we saw a problem that we figured that we could solve before other people saw the same problem. Look at that phone. I mean, that was well advanced, we were seeing ahead. And the great thing about getting a job is you get that experience. I often tell people, if you do exactly what a customer tells you to do, it's going to be late and wrong because customers deal with incrementalism. If you show them a StarTac phone, the flip phones back in the day, they would have told you, you know, how do I make this better? Well, maybe make the buttons a little bit bigger or make it in a different color. Nobody would have told you to invent something like the iPhone. But if you understand the industry, you can have a vision to take you forward. Interesting enough, despite what most people think, the average age of a founder of a tech startup is 39 years old. There are more founders of tech startups in their 50s than are under 25. So Jeff Bezos, right, he was 30 and had significant experience on Wall Street before starting Amazon. Hastings of Netflix was 37. The guys that started WhatsApp, 33 and 37 when they started the company. And they really only started the company because they couldn't get a job at Facebook, having quit at Yahoo. Craigslist, started by a guy named Craig, clever name, when he was 42. Um, Pincus, who had started Zynga, the game company, he was 41. And the guys that started Qualcomm, which powers a lot of the cell, the processors that power a lot of the cell phones that we use today, were 50 and 52. There is something to be said for gaining experience in an industry and seeing and solving problems that others don't even know that they have yet. There's nothing, going, nothing wrong with going to work for a big company or a startup you gain some valuable experience. And the other lesson behind that is build a team. It's my opinion that founders get far, founding CEOs get far too much credit for what truly is a team sport. And a startup, just like that NBA basketball team or a football team or any sport that you can think of, it is all about the team. I don't care what kind of plays a coach will put on the board if he doesn't have players on the field that can go execute them. It makes no difference. So, um, you know, of course there's a lot of stories I can tell you about failure. Uh, my own stories I can tell you about, you know, things I, I did or, you know, maybe could have done better. I don't know. I don't care. It all kind of worked out. And who knows if we had made different decisions or I had made different decisions at various times, what if I ended up in the same place? So a couple of stories about ourselves at Authentech. When our first product came out, I have no idea how much time I'm taking. <laughs> um, when our first product came out, it didn't work. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that it, it, it didn't work well, like it didn't work. There were no electrons coming out of the thing, and I'm not really sure that there were any going in. It was DOA. And by the time we figured that all out, right, you know, I called a meeting. It was probably 25 of us or so, I'm going to guess, right? I used to tell people it was 24 geeks and me. 
And, and so, you know, I called everybody together. It was probably 7 o'clock at night. We all knew the product wasn't working. People generally had this idea that we were running out of money. They had no idea how close we were running out of money. And, you know, we got everybody together, 7 o'clock at night, you know, kind of for a rah-rah speech. And I started the meeting with, how many people don't think we're going to make it? And of the 25 people in the room, you know, probably like 19 raised their hands, right? And frankly, I would have raised my hand, except I thought that would have looked really, really negative. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, no, everything will be fine, rah, 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 we're going to do this and that and that and that, right? So we went out drinking. That should actually be another lesson as part of a startup, but I didn't put that in here. So, you know, we all went out drinking and, uh, you know, came back to work the next day. It was at Bennigan's. Remember when there used to be a Bennigan's here? So we all came back, worked the next day, and we figured out what we were going to do. So the next night, 7 o'clock at night, we get everybody together. Okay, everybody, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do this. We're going to fib it. We're going to spin it. We were smart guys. We had left wafers in the line at various stages, right? We had, we had been experienced. We had seen chips that didn't work before and knew how to turn them really quick, but we had to figure out what the problem was. So we figured out the problem, at least we thought we did. You know, I laid out this plan of what we were going to do and, you know, a little rah-rah speech, and we went out drinking again at Bennigan's. So that second night, I remember getting home, and it was probably the longest conversation I ever had with my wife about work. So, you know, I'd been drinking a little bit. I was a little inebriated, right? We were sitting on the couch in the living room, and I'm just like, wah, 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 wah. Oh, my God, honey, I am so sorry. I quit a good job. You know, I've ruined our lives. What have I done? You know, and for two hours, I just whined about all kinds of things, but particularly about, you know, I've done this, and, you know, we have the three girls, and they're all in school, and what have I done? Now, I'm almost sure Catherine said something during that entire two hours, but I have no idea. But I do remember at the end of that night, she said to me, you know what you need to do, so just go do it. That's all she said. So we went off and did it. She could have said a number of other things, like, you're right, <laughs> you are an idiot, you shouldn't have quit your job, you know, we got to pay for the kids' school, we got to do this, we got to do that. No, she just said, you know what you need to do, so just go do it. So that's incredibly important in terms of that family commitment. I meet a lot of people today that talk about work-life balance, and maybe they don't want to be an entrepreneur, or they want to be an entrepreneur and go home at five. Look, it's a tremendous amount of hard work. And if you think work-life balance has anything to do with the idea of going home at 5 o'clock, you're on freaking drugs. There is no way. Unless you call the guys over in Mumbai, Shanghai, San Jose, and everybody else, and you all agree that you're going to go home at 5 o'clock. It's a flat world. You have competition all over the place, and you better hustle. But to me, the work-life balance always came down to, I only did one of two things. I was either working or feeling guilty about not working, or with my family and feeling guilty about not being with my family. I gave up golf. I gave up everything else. Many people I meet today, right, that, that talk about work-life balance, they want to go home at 5 and work on another startup. They want to go home at 5 and work on their car or go play golf or go do something else. If I was not at work, I was with my family. I was oftentimes at a sporting or school event with my daughters when I was the only dad there. But I would go if I was in town and then go back to work very often. But I had this opportunity to share something with my daughters that not many people have. When we went public in 2007, the morning, that morning, we opened the stock exchange. So we flew the entire staff up to be on the stage when we rang the bell to open the stock exchange. That was pretty cool. Now, everybody, right, families of everybody on the staff were invited up. I didn't pay for them. I pay for the staff. If you wanted your family to come, you had to pay for them, right? But my wife and three daughters were there. And my three daughters, who are now 25, 24, and 21, 
We're the ones to rang, ring the bell to open the stock exchange. Let me tell you, when you have the opportunity to share that with your kids, that's pretty freaking cool. Um, so just, you know, one last uh, little story was, you know, in, we went public in 07 and 08 and 09, we took a tumble. The fact of the matter is, is that with the recession, you know, we were targeting or had been in high-end laptops. And at the end of 08 and the beginning of 09 and really 09 totally, there was no such thing as a high-end laptop. Everybody was talking about $400 netbooks. Our revenues, through no fault of our own, from 08 to 09, went down 30% versus going like that. And I remember when that happened. When our, when our stock, when we announced that we were gonna miss numbers and our stock took a huge tumble, I was black. I mean, if I had probably gone to a psychiatrist, they would have put me in a padded room or giving me drugs. I was that black. I look back at those times and that was wrong. But I took it very personally. I'm the kind of person that wears my emotions on my sleeve and I wore them too hard at that point. I thought I had disappointed so many people. And I had let them down. I mean, everybody at my church owned our stock. So I remember I went to lunch with a guy named John Miller. John Miller was the minister at the time, a very, very good friend before that and after. And I was telling John about what, this is probably three weeks later, and, you know, what had happened. Interesting enough, John didn't really know all the details and that our stock had gone down and that I was getting hammered, right? And that's one of the things when you think about failure, you think everybody knows. And it's a very, very small group of people that might know. And they're probably a lot more understanding than you think. Step aside from that story for a second. I remember going out to investors, and they were actually nice. They were like Scott do you realize what's happened to my other small cap companies? You know, you guys are lucky. You're staying in business. You have a plan. I like what you're doing. I don't own your stock right now, but let's see how you do in a year. They were actually very nice. And they were telling me about, you know, the disasters that happened with a lot of their other um, small cap companies that had completely gone out of business. But to me, it was like telling the guy, like on the Titanic, don't worry, everybody else is dying a slow, miserable death just like you. I, I don't know. It did, you know, it didn't feel that good. I was still black. So I went to lunch with John. I was telling him about it. And, you know, there were tears in my eyes, which is not unusual. I'm somewhat of a wimp. I'm probably one of the only pe people that fainted at all, three births of their children. We're the only family, right, that probably stopped having children because it was dangerous for the father. So I'm a wimp. So I cry a lot. And there are tears coming out of my eyes. And, you know, I'm going back. And John's like, don't worry, don't worry. And I finally said, but John, all these people had faith in me. And John said, then they had faith in the wrong person. Oh. Now you could take that one of two ways. The one that some of you just thought about. Like, you're an idiot, Moody, and it's their own fault for betting on you. That's not that far off. The way he meant it was, is that you know, they should have faith, and he was a Christian minister, in Jesus and in God. And they had, over the last few years when things were going great, kind of forgot about that. Money and success, that was what was important to people. And all of a sudden, all these people were back in church. That's how he meant it. That our faith, no matter what, in, should have been in Jesus. The way I took it, Moody, you're an idiot. Like, why do you think you're this important? You know, not everybody in the world owned money, you know, had, had stock. Nobody probably invested their entire 401k in authentic stock. So pull up your pants, grow up, and get back to work. And we did. So kind of lesson number seven, listen to your own lessons. You can't be afraid. And get your why straight. And for a little while there... I was afraid. I did feel like a failure. And I certainly was totally confused about my why. So I spoke of a lot of people that influenced me in this, but no person influenced me more than my father. 
I'm going to read a letter, and I know I'm going over my time, but it's important to me. It's the first time I've ever read this letter in public. It was a letter I wrote to my dad, unfortunately, slightly after he had died. And the importance of this letter, and it's probably the only thing that I regret in my entire life, not that I can't do a million things better or differently, but a true regret is that I hadn't written this letter or told these things to my father before he died. And so what it, you know, if you think back, or I think back, put it in perspective, was you know, when I was a teenager, I hated my dad. I mean, I hated the guy. There was nothing he could say or do that sat with me at all. If he breathed, I was upset about it. We fought, we argued. I wasn't really a bad kid, right? I, you know, as I said, I didn't get arrested that much. <laughs> but I was a troublesome kid, right? It wasn't like I didn't like authority. It was just I didn't like people telling me what to do. <laughs> Over time, I grew up. I stopped being such a jerk. And I was at a jerk at a time when my dad had gone through very, very difficult times. He lost his job in 72. He was a man who fought in the Korean War and was proud of what he had done and never really found another job again. He worked as a bartender, a doorman. He took any job that he could possibly find. And here is this little freaking weenie making his life miserable. But over time, as I said, that, that healed. I spoke, you know, I used to speak to him coming home from work. We'd talk, he'd listen. He really, you know, and he knew how greatly I loved him. But my dad, in a way, I think thought he was a failure. That he looked at his own business career and he eventually opened a bar, but that didn't do very well. That things didn't turn out the way he had wanted. Now, my dad had grown up in poverty, right? And, um, so to me, was his, his, his dad actually was a sheriff in North Carolina. He was shot three months before he was born, killed, and his mother died at his birth. And here was this little jerk. So let me just read this letter. Probably doesn't have that much to do with entrepreneurialism, but I'll talk about it and how it maybe applies in a second. So... Dear Dad, you are my hero. That was the start of a letter. So, that was the start of a letter to my father. A letter I intended to write, but never did. A letter that I thought I had time to write, but did not. A letter in which I wanted to tell him how much he meant to me, how much I owed him, how much I loved him, and probably most importantly, how very proud I was was of him as my father. I never had a chance to deliver that letter, at least not until today. I read this at his eulogy, or at his funeral, and this is the first time in public. So let me begin again. Dear Dad, you are my hero. Yes, my hero, my idol, as there is no individual I more admire, no other that I have worked harder to emulate, no one that has had a greater influence on my life. There is so much I would like to say, so many things that I want to thank you for, but above all the rest, there are three memories that I have that I will cherish more than all the others. You may not even remember some of this, but I do. Dad, I have a sign in my office that reads, the best thing that a father can do for his children is love their mother. And to that end, there can be no question as to your love, your commitment, your devotion to my mother. She was not only your wife, she was your soulmate, and there can be no doubt that you will both be in love and together through eternity. She had died the year earlier. Of course, an eternity is an awfully long time to actually never win an argument with mom. But in all things, hope springs eternal. It is in that environment of love, commitment, and a family in which you raised Eileen and me. There can be no greater foundation for a child as to come from a home filled with love and caring. You and mom gave us that foundation. Dad, thank you for loving mom. As for the second memory, do you remember the time when I was about eight or nine and we built that little race car together as part of some Cub Scout activity? I can still remember it as if it was yesterday. Such a minor event among the many through the years, but one that had such a tremendous impact on me. You'll remember we received this kit from which we were to make and then race a little car. From a solid piece of wood, I can remember the car we made, a true masterpiece of workmanship, if ever I had seen one. 
For a man who was not known for his skills around the house and a son who clearly followed in your footsteps, it was an amazing piece of work. But it was not the building of the car that I remember the most, but more the race day. You were out of town that week, like me now, traveling quite a bit in those days. As the race day approached, I was convinced we were going to win. I don't mean I was hoping we were going to win. I was convinced we were going to win. It was our destiny. I really wanted you to be there for the races Friday night. As the week went along, you promised you would try, flying back to California from New York. Both you and Mom kept telling me not to get my hopes up, either that you would make it or that we would win. The big night came, and I can remember walking into this huge auditorium with Mom. You hadn't made it home. Of course, as the races began, the inevitable happened. As I expected, our car started winning all the heats. With one eye on the races and the other on the front door of the auditorium, the night went on, and so did the winning. Then it happened. At the exact moment I looked at those double doors for the hundredth time that night, you walked in. It was right in the middle of one of our races, and yet my eyes were not on my car, but on you. My dad, my hero, was there to cheer me on to watch our car win. I know now, Dad, as a father myself, that you were probably there more to console me when we lost to be a shoulder to lean on. But that loss never came. We took first place. Over 500 cars and the car we had built together beat them all. Dad, that night you were there for me like so many other times in my life. Dad, thank you for being there. And finally, Dad, there was a time that because of you I stayed in college. It was 1975. It was a long time ago. And I was just a freshman at NC State, some 500 miles from home. Man, did I hate it. I was lonely, terribly homesick, and frankly, I did not think I was getting anything out of school. Of course, I was 18, and I thought I knew everything. I can remember our first conversation that day after I had walked into the registrar's office and quit. You were mad. I mean, really, really mad. And in my mind, being quite unfair. Where are you going to live, you had asked. And before I could even answer, I remember you saying that if I had any intent to live at home, I was going to pay rent. And that was the good part of the conversation. <laughs> Later that day, when I called back, we both had calmed down. We spoke. You listened. You told me you would support me in any decision I made. And then you cried. At that moment, I knew how important this was to you. Not important for you, but important to you. That I have every opportunity in life. I also knew that it was important to you. If it was important to you, it should be important to me. That Monday, I re-enrolled back in school, and today, I only have you to thank for where I am. Dad, thank you for wanting only the best for me. So Dad, thanks for everything. You have been a great father. You are my best friend. And Dad, I want you to know that you always have been and always will be my hero. My love always, your son, Scott. So what does this have to do with entrepreneurialism, <laughs> right? To me, it's time to redefine entrepreneurialism. It's not about being rich. It's not about being, having this successful company. It's not being on this stage. It's about making a difference. And every person I spoke to you about tonight, Dale, Nick, Dave, my wife, my mother, and so many other people made a significant difference in my life. They, I can tell you now, are as responsible for the touch ID as I am. To me, the whole idea of entrepreneurialism is this idea of seeing a problem and finding a creatively, how do you say that word, right? Finding a creative solution to that problem. That is not just for entrepreneurs. That's for everyone. You can do that as a parent, you can do that in a big company, you can do that in a little company, you can do that with your own company, you can do that as a volunteer. And the people that I usually respect the most for their entrepreneurialism, 
is some of the people that I meet in Africa, the volunteers that go over. These are the kinds of people that can dig a well without a shovel, that can build a house without nails, that can find love where there is none. They know how to solve a problem. Those are my heroes. Those people are making a difference in other people's lives. To me, I always looked at it as kind of, you know, 10, 20 years, 50 years from now, nobody will remember who I am. But it's the people that we touch in our lives that matter. And they continue on. To me, it's almost like this idea of, you know, going to the beach and all this sand, and it all looks the same. And that's like we are. 50 years from now, we'll look like a pebble of sand. But the legacy we leave is the people that we touch. Again, as a father, as a volunteer, the people that we help and make a difference to in their lives. And that's the legacy and all the little pieces of sand that we leave behind. So there's this book, and I only had a couple more things, called Every Good Endeavor, Timothy Keller. And when I've talked about what motivates me, this is something specific to me. But I think he said it better than I just did with that idea of sand. And let me read this two paragraphs. If this is all there is, then everything will eventually burn up in the death of the sun, and no one will even be around to remember anything that has happened. Everyone will be forgotten. Nothing we do will make any difference, and all good endeavors, even the best, will come to naught. Unless there is a God. If God exists and there is a true reality beneath and behind this one, and this life is not the only life, then every good endeavor, even the simplest ones, pursued in response to God's calling, can matter forever. So what you do matters if you get the why right. That is what matters no matter how simple what you do can matter forever. So I want to finish with this poem. Uh, it's kind of the spirit of dreaming and wanting the best, whether it's for your children, your company, the people behind you. But I actually found it in my father's affairs. I read it as his funeral, and I'd like to read it now. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Thank you. Thank you.